Senator Ludlam. Thanks, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to oppose this bill in the strongest possible terms. This is the latest sordid chapter in a race to the bottom, and many of us, I guess, thought maybe it would not come to this. Just when you think that this government can't get any more vindictive in its treatment of innocent families fleeing war and violence, just when you think this government couldn't get any more sadistic, secretive and authoritarian in its attitude towards some of the most vulnerable people in the world, this government will find a way to surprise you. So I'm now beyond surprising. In truth, the ruination of Australia's arguably proud record of providing safe harbour to people seeking to escape political or sectarian violence has been a long time coming, and there's no point in laying all of the blame at the feet of Minister Scott Morrison. From the moment that the ALP and the Liberal National parties settled their bipartisan consensus that henceforth Australian refugee policy would rest on the principle of deterrence, a bill like the one that we debate tonight was practically inevitable. Because to deter people from fleeing the Iranian secret police or the medieval violence of the Taliban or the horrors faced by the Rohingya in the western part of Burma or the murderous repression that passes for official state policy in Sri Lanka, your policy will inevitably end up in a very dark place indeed. The United Nations has recognised this. The Australian High Court has recognised this. Advocates who work face to face with refugees and fleeing the kind of hell holes uh, that people, or the unfortunate circumstances that people find themselves in, uh, refugees themselves and those advocates, people like Amnesty International, who keep an eye on the kind of horrific situations that people find themselves in around the world have looked at Australian government policy in recent years and found us severely wanting. The refugee convention that the Australian government will effectively shred tonight was written in the aftermath of the Second World War. The precursor um, uh, organisation to the UN High Commission for Refugees was the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. It was actually set up in 1943. Uh, while uh, in, the, in the latter part of the Second World War to provide humanitarian relief to the, to the vast numbers of potential and existing refugees in areas that were facing Allied liberation at the time. Millions of people on the move, fleeing um, the various fronts of the war. And so it was evident, and it had been evident after the First World War, but it was certainly very evident um, in the aftermath of the Second World War that we needed to ensure that what had faced those people fleeing Nazi Germany um, in various allied uh, territories uh, or occupied territories, um, those fleeing regimes as they fell as the fronts in the ruination of war shifted from place to place, that people would never again find themselves as those uh, many Jews, for example, fleeing the Holocaust found themselves stateless, unwanted, shunted from port to port. And it was decided by the international community in the aftermath of the Second World War that nobody should face these horrors again, that nations that considered themselves civilised should have an obligation to provide safe harbour for people with legitimate reasons to flee regimes, to flee war, to flee violence, to flee occupations, to flee persecutions. And so we ended up um, a proud signatory of the 1951 Refugee Convention. And I don't think there would actually be any disagreement in this chamber tonight that Australia ended up as a better place for participating in that convention, for recognising the horrific circumstances faced by families fleeing war and violence, and for allowing people to make a new home in this country. It's made Australia what it is. And, oh, of course it has its flaws. Um, it has so many of its flaws, but you could also argue that Australia is one of the most successful experiments in genuine multiculturalism anywhere in the world. As a result, in part, of our accession to the 1951 Refugee Convention that said, as a civilised country, as a democracy and as human beings, we would provide safe harbour to people when they needed it. The convention was obviously more or less limited um, in its initial draft to protecting European refugees in the aftermath of the war. But of course the 1967 protocol, which Australia also signed, expanded its scope as the problem of displacement, uh, displacement spread around the world. 
And that is why the bill that we're faced with tonight will do such damage, not just to Australia's international reputation, not just to our evident disrespect for the rule of law here and overseas, but most importantly to those families and those individuals and those children who find themselves, through having committed no crime and no fault of their own, on the move and forced to flee their homes. We have a bill tonight that will grant almost total impunity to Minister Scott Morrison and whoever comes after him in the continued process of the militarisation of a humanitarian crisis. And that, I think, is something that Prime Minister Howard kind of put down in draft. We saw during the Tampa crisis what that looks like when you have a cargo ship boarded by the SAS and cue the militarised press conferences and the chest thumping uh, that arguably changed the course of an election, to what we see now, Minister Morrison, flanked by men and women in uniform, having militarised a humanitarian crisis. And this bill grants almost total impunity to a minister who has already shown himself fundamentally secretive and untrustworthy. And I genuinely fear for what powers that this bill would grant an individual like Minister Scott Morrison, that his authoritarian tendencies, when he thinks he can score some kind of political point, brutalising people who already have uh, lost so much, I genuinely fear um, what this will actually mean for people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves on the front line. It's a bill that seeks to reintroduce temporary protection visas, and I guess that is what has seemed to have dominated the public debate and public understanding of this bill. Temporary protection visas that effectively invite people to put their children on boats if there's no other way uh, of no other hope of family reunification. We understand that the uh, Palmer United Party, and I think Senator Lazarus will. Uh, We'll speak later in this debate about the concessions, if you could call it that, that Mr Palmer has been able to extract, creates a safe, ha a safe haven enterprise visa, but of course the bill doesn't actually do any such thing. And Mr Palmer again appears to have engaged in the tactic of creating all kinds of diversionary press conferences, putting himself in front of cameras demanding concessions, marching around the landscape as though he's some kind of dealmaker, and has come away with precisely nothing. There's nothing in the bill that give any kind of life to the concessions he says he has extracted. And we've seen this repeated pattern of behaviour. And maybe everyone does have their price. It's just that Mr Palmer's is very, very low. But we don't see anything in the bill as it's drafted that would give any kind of expectation of permanent protection to people who find themselves um, uh, in this country, no matter how they've managed to get here after um, fleeing some of these horrific circumstances. The bill effectively will redefine the definition of refugee to be whatever the minister of the day says it is. And although Mr Morrison appears to be using hundreds of children who should have never been detained in the first place as a bargaining chip. And again, we see the kind of compassion that I think has driven this debate for many years, where people right across the political spectrum, all parties, independent, liberal, Labor, Green, horrified at the number of people who are making risky voyages on unseaworthy vessels and finding that the boats simply weren't able to get them here so many people who died in the crossing. And that compassion, that compassion that was felt by people right across the debate has been so callously manipulated. And that is, again, what I think is happening tonight, that the crossbenchers have been told that Minister Morrison will trade off children behind razor wire who should never have been put there in the first place as though they were poker chips in a political negotiation. What kind of sociopath? engages in a political uh, debate or a political negotiation 
using the lives of children who have fled from Hazara lands in Afghanistan or Sri Lanka. It's very, very hard to fathom how it could possibly have come to this. Those children could be released tomorrow, irrespective of the outcome of this debate tonight. That is what the Labor Party understands. It's what the Greens understand. And I would urge those other crossbenchers, some of whom have made their positions clear and some of whom have not, to rest with that consideration overnight, because that decision will be on their conscience and on all of ours, irrespective of which way the vote goes when it's committed. The bill effectively removes most references to the Refugee Convention from Australia's Migration Act. And this is something that I'm not expecting will make the front pages of the paper tomorrow, because for whatever reason, Australians having living, uh, spending our lives in such a fortunate part of the world, most of us, if we're lucky, won't ever have to think carefully about what human rights actually mean in the flesh or what international humanitarian law actually means <coughs> to families, to real individuals. <coughs> These things are seen by most of us uh, mediated through television screens happening to other people. But these instruments were put there for a purpose. Um, as I described briefly earlier, they were put there so that those of Jewish uh, descent fleeing the horrors of Nazi Germany, that nobody would ever have to face what they had faced, or those fleeing Poland would never, uh, that, that their story would never be repeated again. That's the flesh and blood behind these human rights in instruments that this government is so casually violating in the terms outlined in this bill. What kind of legislator, what kind of leader, what kind of politician determines that the children of boat arrivals who were born in Australia, in Australian hospitals, are nonetheless unauthorised maritime arrivals. It's bleak. It's not even ironic. It's an incredibly black piece of legislation. And yet that's what this bill does. Newborn children classified as unauthorised maritime arrivals. How did it come to this, this degree of political dehumanisation? The amendments that are outlined in this bill, and of, of course there will be further debate on this when we get to the committee stage and amendments um, that will shape the final form of the bill, and I'll leave um, comment on those to my colleague Senator Hanson Young, who's carried the burden of government policies um, under the former government and under this government as they've sought this race to the bottom, as governments of both persuasion have sought to outdo each other in that deterrent effect that would somehow make Australian government policy scarier than the Taliban or the Iranian secret police. We will see what kind of final form this bill ends up in. But in the meantime, I fear that this Senate is going to fail these people tonight and that again we will see that the kind of resistance and the hope and the compassion wielded by those people a long way from Capitol Hill actually provides the real opposition and the real hope in refugee policy in Australia. Um, in my own hometown, groups like the Refugee Rights Action Network, right across Australia, a movement called Love Makes a Way. People of faith who have taken some of the most significant parts of scripture about loving thy neighbour very literally indeed and hundreds of them have risked arrest, many of them have been arrested, in peaceful, non-violent sit-ins in ministers' office, uh, ministers' offices around the country, including that of my Western Australian colleague, Senator Cash, who's here tonight. Respectful but defiant that we simply cannot continue this hateful race to the bottom. And I want to acknowledge all of those who've taken those kind of matters into their own hands to ensure that there is some hope uh, in the Australian community for compassionate policy on refugees, because it's very, very hard to find it in this building. Groups like the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, who work with those who arrived with nothing and are trying to make their way in the Australian community or uh, prevent deportation, groups like the Refugee Council, 
groups, as I said, like the Refugee Rights Action Network, that do everything from political advocacy, um, frontline activism, visits to detention centres where people find themselves detained for years despite the fact that they have committed no crime. And one particular project that, for me, we can talk about the high-level policy of lifting the humanitarian intake, we can talk about the Green Safer Pathways proposal, lifting the humanitarian intake to 30,000 to take the pre pressure off those people who found themselves stranded in transit camps in Malaysia and Indonesia, to, out of that target of 30,000 to take 10,000 from those camps in our region where people have been told there is no queue. That is what creates the business model that the people smugglers exploit. If you want to just momentarily lapse into the language adopted by the coalition, if you want to smash that business model, remove the incentive to climb onto a boat, not by trying to make people more terrified of the Australian government than they are of the Sri Lankan white vans, but by offering them hope, by offering them a chance at a safe harbour. You might be in this camp for a period of time, but you will be safe while you're here and you will eventually be resettled. You want to dissolve the people smugglers' business model, that's how to do it. The Greens propose an additional $70 million per year in emergency funding for safe assessment centres in Indonesia to enable this kind of process and to give people confidence that they won't be in these camps forever while they wait for assessment and resettlement. And we propose to shut down all offshore detention in Nauru and PNG. This is not simply about getting children out of detention, it's about getting all human beings out of detention. There are many, many policy instruments. If we simply set the racist undertones of this debate aside, if we cease the race to the bottom, we we'll try and terrify people out of fleeing military dictatorships and war zones and actually adopt a compassionate approach. With all sides of politics engaged in that project, we could potentially regain some of the dignity that we had under the Fraser government when we resettled tens of thousands of people fleeing the Vietnam War, a war that Australia was also implicated in. Um, and that at that time, nobody on either side of the old uh, political parties decided to throw rocks, and there was a bipartisan consensus at the time that these people should not be used as political bargaining chips, perhaps a more civilised political age. But it is our hope that we can return to that kind of civilised debate where people, and particularly children, are not treated as some kind of political weapon to be wielded in pursuit of one cheap headline after another. I want to particularly acknowledge um, Jared, Therese and Tyson for their um, first home project in Western Australia. And this is what I think Australian refugee policy would look like if it actually proceeded from love rather than fear. The first home project is a unique experiment where funding was crowdsourced for a home uh, in Perth's eastern suburbs, where recently arrived refugees could actually live, get themselves a rental history, and of course, as we know um, from our work in homelessness policy, if you've got somewhere to live, you can build a life. You can go out and get the services that you're looking for, you can get job training, you can learn the language, your kids can go to school, you can actually find a way in our community. And this was created with absolutely no government support at all. And it's a wonderful experiment. People end up moving on after a year in the place with a rental history. They can go out into the private rental market. Uh, and it is that kind of Australian spirit of welcome and compassion that I think surely, surely that is what most Australian people want for this debate to proceed, not with fear, but with love and compassion. For people who actually have nowhere else to go in many instances and have fled circumstances that we uh, in this wealthy and very fortunate place could barely imagine. And so that is what I hope the crossbenchers tonight will rest with, as we all rest with these kind of debates. And I wish, in fact, that these debates were, get, were considered conscience votes. Um, for all of us in here, I think it is that serious with these lives at stake, that just for once we could see party discipline relax. We could see the talking points set aside. We could treat people as human beings, not collateral in a political debate that long since passed the point of dismal. As Australians, whatever our political allegiances, we can do better than this kind of bill that we're contemplating tonight. Thank you, Senator Ludlam. Senator